strongly recommend for people to understand what's going on is to order the three DVD special that we have that contains all ten of our present programs that we offer uh, and that's for eight dollars and that contains a 299 page book, three magazines, three audios, flyers and the shipping. So that's something also that we would strongly recommend people to get to fully understand what we're talking about. They need to see the information that's contained on these tapes and the written information that provides the documentation for what we're saying, provides the sources for where we're getting this information uh, from, so that if the people question the veracity of what we're saying and they question, you know, where you're getting this stuff, we give you the books, we give you the page numbers so that people can check this stuff out. So one of the things that people need to realize is that the, the present crisis that uh, we have today has been predicted. It was predicted first really uh, of recent memory at Our Lady of La Salette, France, when she appeared to two little children on September 19, 1846, and she said, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The church will be in eclipse, seemingly blocked out, that the church will always still be here, but for a lot of people it will be hard to find. It will be blocked out by something, and it's going to be blocked out by a counterfeit Catholic church that will be set up from the city of Rome, that God will allow a counterfeit Catholic church to be set up to sort of block uh, the view of a lot of people that don't want to really find the truth from finding true Catholicism, even though true Catholicism will still always be here. Uh, it will be hard to see for some people unless they really search and, and dig and try to find out what's going on, uh, that will have this counterfeit church set up uh, God will allow it as a supreme punishment for the sins of the world for a counterfeit church to be set up from the city of Rome. And we can see this present apostasy manifested by the documents of the Second Vatican Council, by the apostasy of John Paul II and now Benedict XVI, and we're going to be discussing some of those things uh, today. Uh, some of the actions that people need to uh, realize or find out about, namely uh, John Paul II, for example, uh, that he completely rejected that the Catholic Church should convert people to the Catholic faith. This is really one of the biggest heresies of the post-Vatican II sect, that they don't believe that you actually have to be a Catholic to be saved. And we know that the Catholic Church has defined seven times infallibly that there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. And he utterly rejected this, and this is uh, shown by his statements, for example, on March 21, 2000, John Paul II said, In Jordan, may St. John the Baptist protect Islam. Uh, on May 14, 1999, John Paul II bowed and kissed the Koran, which blasphemes the Trinity, says that Jesus Christ is not God. Article to it, it, it blasphemes the Trinity. Um, he, John Paul II, on March 26, 2000, prayed at the Western or Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Uh, which, and he's also taught that the Old Covenant religion is valid. Namely, people can practice Judaism, they can reject Christ, and they can be saved. They're perfectly fine rejecting Christ and the Messiah. And him praying at the Western Wailing Wall on March 26, 2000 was very significant because that temple was the only temple where Jews could offer a sacrifice. And it was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus and the Roman army. And so, therefore, for him to go there, and it was a sign by God allowing the temple, the great temple, to be destroyed, that Judaism as a religion had ended and that Jews were now to enter and join the Catholic Church, uh, that the old covenant religion is over. And Christ, of course, says, I give you a new covenant. And so, therefore, it was a sign that their temple where they offered their sacrifices was destroyed, that they should join the Catholic Church, and the religion had ended. So John Paul II praying, and uh, you know, putting a, a prayer in the niche of the wall at the Western Wailing Wall. It's a total act of apostasy. Uh, it's a sign to all Jews that they're fine as Jews. Uh, that's what John Paul II's thinking was, and that they don't have to believe in Christ. In fact, when he did this, prayed at the Western Wall, about the whole nation of Israel was watching on television, so it was a very clear sign that they didn't have to convert. He also, on April 13, 1986, he prayed in the great synagogue of Jerusalem in Rome, uh, and he actually bowed his head as the Jews said a prayer for the coming of their Messiah, which, of course, is not Christ. 
Um, you know, there are other actions John Paul II prayed. Uh, he said that all men are saved, all men are justified, uh, on and on and on. He, he actually signed numerous joint declarations with the heads of different Eastern schismatic sects. Uh, for instance, the Eastern Orthodox Patriarch Teotest and John Paul II signed a joint declaration, uh, both denouncing that they wanted to convert each other. And so this is a manifest heresy, a direct denial of Catholic dogma. And also, uh, going back to the prophecies, also at Fatima, people need to realize the third secret of Fatima, the people who have really read the third secret of Fatima, not the phony one that was released by the Vatican, and we'll get into the phony third secret, maybe not in this program, but in a future program, but the people who have read the real third secret of Fatima all say it deals with a massive apostasy from the Catholic faith, seemingly inside the Catholic Church, that starts from the very top of the Catholic Church. Namely, the person who will claim to be Pope at a certain point in history will actually promote a, a, the great apostasy that's predicted and foretold in Scripture. And many people will lose the faith, and it will cause people to lose the faith uh, because they'll simply just say, well, I'm following the quote Pope, I'm following the quote bishops. And God will allow this as, a, as the supreme punishment for the sins of the world, for his church to be infiltrated and, and seemingly occupied, at least the infrastructure, the buildings. They actually won't be legitimate rulers, and they aren't re legitimate rulers, but they will seem to many, as since they're in seem, the buildings and the Vatican and so forth, that people, a lot of people just blindly follow and think that they can save their souls and that they're still Catholic, just following these changes because they come from people who they think are legitimate authorities. And so we also will get into showing how the Catholic Church has taught that if you're a manifest heretic, if you manifestly reject, obstinately reject a teaching, a defined teaching of the Catholic Church, you automatically, ipso facto, place yourself outside the Catholic Church. And so, therefore, these guys, these bishops, all believe that you don't have to convert to Catholicism. Other religions are fine. Other religions are great. No one needs to convert. Um, and this is apostasy. And so, therefore, uh, this is what is actually predicted in the Third Secret of Fatima. Those who have read the real Third Secret of Fatima say that it talks about a massive apostasy that seems to come from the very top of the Catholic Church, which, of course, actually will not be the top of the Catholic Church, but will be an anti-pope posing as a real pope who will promote this apostasy. And then also, we have the fact that in Catholic history, we've had 40 anti-popes in church history, men who have claimed to be a, a real pope, real popes of the Catholic Church, and have actually been anti-popes, even some anti-popes ruling from the city of Rome and deceiving people. Numerous cases where the majority of the College of Cardinals followed these anti-popes, uh, where you had massive confusion for long periods of time, like the Great Western Schism, which we'll discuss some of that. Um, and we're also going to discuss some of the specific heresies in Vatican II, uh, because there are most of the people who would be listening to this program and who have come to uh, realize that there's a major crisis in the Catholic faith or pertaining to the Catholic Church uh, have discovered that it, it has something to do with Vatican II, which brought in all of these revolutionary changes. But many of them deny that the actual teachings of Vatican II are the cause of this. They say that you know, it's due to misrepresentations of Vatican II. Uh, it's not actually the teaching of Vatican II. In fact, I recently heard an audio tape. Uh, it was done by a guy who actually published a number of articles attacking state of Vicantism in some different publications. And he was saying that he challenged a leading state of Vicantist thinker from Cincinnati to produce some of the false doctrines in Vatican II. And the leading state of a conscious thinker that he challenged, uh, according to this person, came up empty. Uh, he wasn't able to produce any false doctrines of Vatican II. And this person who has been attacking state of a conscious, state of a contism concluded that this proves my point. Uh, so in order to demonstrate that there are actually false doctrines in Vatican II, manifest heresies, uh, we're going to go through a few of the the specific ones. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is in Nostra Aetate number four, in the decree on non-Christian religions. Uh, in Nostra Aetate number four, it says that the Jews should not be looked upon as having been rejected or accursed by God. 
This directly contradicts what the Catholic Church infallibly defined at the Council of Florence. In the bowl, at the Council of Florence, it was defined that all who hold a different opinion than the Catholic Church on Jesus Christ or the Trinity, the Church rejects. And what's very interesting about this is that the word in Latin that it uses is the word reprobat, which means the Church rejects this opinion. Of, and it rejects anyone, actually any individual, who holds a pers- a, an opinion that is different from the Catholic Church on Jesus Christ or the Trinity. Well, Vatican II, in declaring that the Jews should not be considered as having been rejected, uses the word reprobati, which comes from the same verb reprobo. So it's using the exact same verb to teach exactly the opposite of an, an infallible dogmatic definition. It doesn't get any more heretical than that. And this teaching that the Jews are not to be considered as having been rejected by God is the reason why we see Benedict XVI going to the synagogue. It's the reason why we saw John Paul II going to the synagogue. It's the reason that they teach that the Old Covenant is valid, which is also condemned by the Council of Florence. It's the reason that the bishops in communion with Benedict XVI and John Paul II have published documents stating that the Jews do not need to be converted and so this is the, the biggest heresy, the most specific heresy in Vatican II, utterly indefensible. And it proves, contrary to the claims of those who would say that there are no direct false teachings in Vatican II, that absolutely there are. We could also go to uh, Orientalium Ecclesiarum number 27. This is Vatican II's decree on Eastern Catholic churches. Uh, it says here that non-Catholics members of the Eastern Schismatic Church who are not in full communion with the Catholic Church can receive Holy Communion. Now this, of course, most Catholics know is directly contrary to what the Church has taught for 2,000 years. Uh, It was actually specifically condemned by three different popes. Uh, We have the quotes on this in our material. I'm going to locate them here. Uh, Where the popes say that he who eats the lamb outside the Church is condemned, is profane. And this is, again, rooted in Catholic dogma. Pope Eugene IV at the Council of Florence defined that since there's no salvation outside the church, receiving the sacraments outside the church does not profit one into salvation. And those who receive Holy Communion outside the church receive it to their own damnation, according to the teachings of the popes. And so we have Vatican II teaching that non-Catholics can receive Holy Communion. This is, licitly, this is very heretical, uh, and, of course, it's repeated in the New Catechism. It's repeated in John Paul II's Code of Canon Law. It's repeated as in, in his encyclicals. In fact, in his encyclical Ut Unum Sint, in uh, commenting on this teaching, John Paul II says that we must never uh, forget about the ecclesiological implications of the sharing in the sacraments. In other words, because we can give them Holy Communion, we must recognize that they are part of the same church. That's the whole point, that the Vatican II sect believes that Eastern schismatics, Protestant denominations and sects and their members are part of the Catholic Church. Uh, Another heresy we could get into, the whole decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio in Vatican II, is incredibly heretical. In fact, I'm just amazed that anyone could read this document, as many so-called traditionalists have, and actually defend it. You know, you hear these programs and articles by these individuals trying to reconcile the decree on ecumenism with Catholic teaching, and it's just utterly utterly ridiculous. Uh, In the decree on ecumenism, it says that members of Protestant and Eastern schismatic sects, just referring to those who are, quote, not in full communion with the Catholic Church, it says that they are brought into a partial communion with the Catholic Church. Well, according to the teaching of the Catholic Church, for instance, Pope Leo XIII, In 1896, he wrote an encyclical all about the unity of the church, uh, Satis Cognitum. And in there, he he reiterated and taught what the church has always held throughout history. He said, the practice of the church has always been the same, as is shown by the unanimous teaching of the fathers, who held as outside Catholic communion and alien to the church, anyone who would recede in the least degree from any point of doctrine proposed by her authoritative magisterium. So you have the ordinary and universal teaching of the Catholic Church, as expressed by Pope Leo XIII and Saptus Cognitum, that 
all these members of heretical sects who reject Catholic teaching, even in the least degree, are alien to the Catholic Church. They're utterly outside. That's the teaching of the Catholic Church. Vatican II, in direct contradiction of that, teaches that they are in partial communion. That is heresy. Uh, in the same vein there, in the same context, Vatican II teaches that the members of these communities, okay, the members who are born into these communities and grow up in them believing in Christ, okay, so it's speaking generally of all the Protestants who are born and raised in these communities and grow up in them, even those who reject the church for years, it makes no distinction, it says they cannot be accused of the sin of separation. Well, what's the sin of separation? That's obviously heresy and schism. By heresy or schism, the church teaches you separate yourself from the church. So Vatican II, speaking indiscriminately of Protestants and schismatics, doesn't make any uh, qualification whatsoever. It says that they cannot be accused of the sin of separation. So no Protestant could be considered a heretic. And this, of course, is completely heretical. Uh, Another major heresy in Vatican II, of course, which most many traditionalists or those who claim to be traditionalists have figured out is the Declaration on Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae. And uh, the Catholic Church historically has always taught, and many popes, such as Pope Leo XIII, Pope Gregory XVI, etc., have condemned the heresy of religious liberty and taught that it is the duty of states to defend the Catholic religion and states have the right, and indeed the duty, to publicly to suppress the public expression of non-Catholic religions. Okay, the idea that the state cannot suppress the public expression of non-Catholic religions was explicitly condemned in the Syllabus of Errors. Well, in Vatican II, we find the very thing condemned by Pope Pius IX in the Syllabus of Errors taught it says the state exceeds its authority if it dares to prevent any religious activity. And it teaches the heresy of religious liberty, which has been condemned by numerous popes. And this is another example of direct heresy. And if you don't believe that, if you're not convinced of that, well, Benedict XVI himself, in his book Principles of Catholic Theology, he admitted that the teaching of Vatican II on religious liberty constitutes a counter syllabus of Pope Pius IX, admitting that it goes counter, it's contrary to what the Catholic Church infallibly teaches and has condemned in the decree in uh, the syllabus of errors. People people need to think about the significance of that kind of statement. You know, he's saying it's a whole new teaching, you know, and he's saying that the teaching of Pius IX was was corrected. Yeah, he even says that numerous times. He says he even says that there can be no return to the syllabus of errors. It's just bold heresy right in your face, announcing that it's a new religion. Uh, moving along, another explicit heresy in Vatican II would be uh, the teaching in Lumen Gentium, number 16, that Muslims and Catholics worship the same God. Of course, Muslims don't accept the Trinity Muhammad said God had no son, therefore they don't worship Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Uh, and if you don't believe that, if you say, well, Muslims aren't polytheistic, they're monotheistic, therefore it is the same God, well, then you'd have to admit that anyone who claims to worship one God worships the same God as Catholics. Such as if someone said, I worship Lucifer as the one God. Well, you'd have to admit that he would be worshipping the same God as Catholics, if you're going to argue that Muslims and Catholics worship the same God. But obviously they don't. Uh, Vatican II also showers praise on Buddhism and Hinduism, religions that have always been held to be false and pagan religions. It says in uh, Nostra Aetate that in Buddhism, a way is taught by which let me just get the actual quote here. Yeah, and we see that with Paul VI also promoting the teachings of Vatican II. Bud Paul VI, for example, said that Buddhism is one of the riches of Asia. I mean, think about that. He's saying that Buddhism is one of the riches of Asia. A, a false religion 
totally rejects Christ. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's just utter heresy. Uh, okay, here it is. This is from Nostra Aetate number two. In Buddhism, according to its various forms, the radical inadequ inadequacy of this changeable world is acknowledged, and a way is taught whereby those with a devout and trustful spirit may be able to reach either a state of perfect freedom or the highest illumination. So, in Buddhism, a way is taught whereby you could reach the highest illumination. It's utter apostasy. Yep. It, it praises Hinduism and its profound and penetrating philosophical investigations, even though Hindus worship uh, some 330,000 false gods, which, according to scripture, are devils. Uh, yeah. Another major heresy in Vatican II is uh, also found in Lumen Gentium. Uh, the Catholic Church, as we were discussing earlier, teaches that you separate yourself from the church if you reject the faith, if you reject a dogma. That's heresy. Okay, You excommunicate yourself from the church. And also pertaining to that is the necessity of accepting the papacy, the establishment that Christ set up upon St. Peter. He founded the church upon St. Peter. And so if you have a true pope, you cannot reject the true pope without excommunicating yourself from the church. That's been reiterated countless times. So the criteria for Catholic unity, first and foremost, is baptism, acceptance of the whole faith, the, the complete Catholic faith, and acceptance of the papacy. Well, Vatican II teaches, so in other words, the church is not united with those who do not accept the papacy and do not accept the Catholic faith. Well, Vatican II actually teaches exactly the opposite. In Lumen Gentium 15, the so-called dogmatic constitution on the church, it says, okay, here it is. Uh, for several reasons, the church recognizes that it is joined to those who, though baptized and so honored with the Christian name, do not profess the faith in its entirety or do not preserve communion under the successor of St. Peter. So it lists the two things we just talked about, accepting the papacy, preserving communion under the successor of St. Peter, and professing the faith in its entirety. And it says the church is joined to those people who do not do these things. Uh, this, of course, is heresy. Uh, and there are many quotes which could be given. And also we see the false concept of, you know, this, this they don't understand what unity is. Unity is one of the four marks of the Catholic Church. According to Bank 16, John Paul II, and these anti-popes, they believe that all so-called Christian churches are part of the one true church of Christ. You know, that unity is not just possessed by embracing Catholicism, that the unity of the church exists with all groups and churches that claim to be Christian. You know, the Methodist church, the, the Lutheran church, they're all the Christian church, according to these guys. They don't believe that unity is to achieved by embracing the one true Christian religion, which is Catholicism. And that's why Pope, uh, Leo the, the, Pope Pius XI, in his encyclical Mortalium Animos of January 6, 1928, he said, for the union of Christians can only be promoted by promoting the return to the one true church of Christ of those who are separated from it. This is utterly rejected by uh, these anti-popes and by the teachings of the Second Vatican Council, where they actually have told persons who want to convert to Catholicism that, no, you know, you should stay where you are. You're fine as a member of the Schismatic Orthodox Church. You're fine as a Lutheran. And also, they have promoted this heretical idea that they're saints and martyrs from all the different so-called Christian churches. In fact, the uh, Jubilee 2000 celebrations uh, for new martyrs, they called it, uh, in March and May of 2000, they commemorated these, all these new martyrs, many of which were non-Catholics. In fact, the only two that were mentioned at this ceremony, which was held um, you know, in Rome, uh, were two non-Catholics, a Lutheran, uh, quote, bishop, and a member of the Schismatic Orthodox Church. They were the only two that were mentioned publicly in this ceremony commemorating new martyrs. And it's also taught in John Paul II's encyclical Ut Unum Sin. He says that the saints and, and martyrs come from all the different churches. And, of course, this is heresy also.
Yeah, it directly contradicts Pope Eugene the Fourth in his famous bull Cantate Domino, where at the very end he says, "No one, even if he pour out his blood for the name of Christ, can be saved unless he abide within the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church." Uh, there are other heresies in Vatican II we could go through. Uh, many others. Some of the other heresies, like of John Paul II. John Paul II, for example, also said that heaven, hell, and purgatory are not actual places. This is heresy. Uh, we know that hell is a place. We know that heaven is is a place also. The assumption, the, the body of Mary is in heaven. That's a defined Catholic teaching that you have to believe to be a Catholic. But he said in the summer of 1999 that heaven, hell, and purgatory are not actual places. That's also taught in his new so-called catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, he also, uh, John Paul II, going back to him, had many uh, friends that were Jewish in which he did not attempt to convert them or mention that they had to be converted, one of which was his best friend, Jersey Kluger, who said that John Paul II's relationship with him has, has made him feel more Jewish. Uh, another friend of John Paul II was Gilbert Levine, um, who... Uh, was asked by John Paul II to conduct a concert in the Vatican to commemorate the Holocaust. I, I think maybe during this concert to commemorate, commemorate uh, members uh, that died during the Holocaust, they actually covered the crucifixes so they wouldn't, quote, offend any Jews. Uh, Gilbert Levine also said that John Paul II actually gave him a menorah, gave him a menorah, and he also said, that this was on CNN's Larry King Live, that John Paul II, on the days where his children had their bar mitzvahs, John Paul II, through um, Cardinal, the apostate Cardinal William Keeler of the Vatican II Church, sent a letter in which he congratulated his children for their bar mitzvahs and said, live your Jewish faith out to its full. So people need to realize this is a new gospel. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ states that he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, he who does not shall be condemned. You know, this is something where this is a totally new gospel. And so when we're confronted with these obviously heretical teachings, this new religion coming from those who purport to hold positions of authority in the church, we have to ask ourselves, what does the church teach about this? And if you look at what the doctors of the church have said, for instance, St. Robert Bellarmine, who addressed the question of what would happen if a man who claims to be the Pope were to become a manifest heretic. And he says this, quote, A Pope who is a manifest heretic automatically ceases to be Pope and head, just as he ceases automatically to be a Christian and a member of the Church. Wherefore, he can be judged and punished by the Church. This is the teaching of all the ancient fathers who teach that manifest heretics immediately lose all jurisdiction. And all the saints who have addressed this question of of a pope who becomes a manifest heretic, agree that he would cease to be the pope. In fact, if you have the book, The Catholic Controversy, you can get that from Tan Books. It's, it's a very interesting book written by St. Francis de Sales, a doctor of the church. He says in there, now when the pope is explicitly a heretic, he falls ipso facto, by that very fact, from his dignity and out of the church. So the conclusion follows from the fact that these claimants, these post-Vatican II claimants, are clearly heretics. We can prove that over and over again. And the teaching of the Catholic Church is that heretics cannot be popes. And, and Yes, and, th and this is also the teaching of Pope Paul IV, who wrote in his bull, Cum Ex Apostolatus Officio, um, that someone who would seem to be elected, even if all the cardinals seem to elect him as pope, if he could be shown to have deviated from the Catholic faith, uh, that his election could not be accepted by anyone as being valid. Uh, so we have, you know, the teaching of Pope Paul IV. We have the teaching of Saint Alphonsus, Saint Francis de Sales, Saint Robert Bellarmine, all teaching that a manifest heretic cannot be pope. That therefore, for that reason of him being a manifest heretic. And that it can be shown, you know, public heresy is something that can be known by people. That's all that has to be known is that he's doing these things, he's manifestly rejecting Catholic teachings. If people recognize that, those facts, or they can find out about that information, they must reject these people. Because, 
you have to, by divine laws, Pope Leo XIII states in his encyclical on the unity of the church, Satis Cognitum, of June 29, 1896, that this unity of communion between people in the Catholic Church and the Pope is something that uh, must be there. You have to have a oneness of faith with the Roman pontiff if, if you have a valid one by divine law. You can't just say, well, my faith isn't the same as John Paul II or Benedict XVI. A lot of people are saying this kind of stuff. And Pope Pius XII, for example, in his encyclical Mystici Corpus Christi of June 29, 1943, states that those who are divided in faith or in government cannot be living in the unity of the same body, the same church. So if you would say that you don't have the same faith as John Paul II or Benedict XVI or Paul VI, what you're saying is that you're not in the same church as these persons. And if you do say that, well, yeah, uh, my faith is the same as John Paul II or Benedict XVI, you're in communion with heretics, you're in a heretical church, you're not in the Catholic Church. And people would say, well, where is the Catholic Church then? St. Athanasius says that even if the church were reduced to a handful of true believers and, say, one priest, they would be the true church of Christ on earth. And this is actually what's predicted by our Lord, as can be clearly seen uh, in Luke 18.8, where he says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find the faith on the earth? There are many, many prophecies uh, about anti-popes in the last days. St. Bernard was of the opinion that the Antichrist himself would be an anti-pope. Yeah, he, he said actually that the only way that the Antichrist could deceive the whole world is by becoming an anti-pope, one whom the world at large would believe is a true pope, but an actual fact would not be. And because it's something where these guys are getting people to do what no emperor could do, namely to get people uh, to give up their, their Catholic faith. Not that they, they could force anyone to do that, uh, because anyone could resist, but they are attempting to get people to lose the faith, to embrace heresy, to assimilate and imbibe all these heretical things that will make them leave the Catholic Church. And see, the fact that they're claiming to be a pope or a bishop, and the people say, well, I'm just following them, you know, that's how they're giving up their faith. And so therefore, that's why these guys are the most destructive and deadly persons that have ever lived. And so basically... Uh I think we should discuss some of the different, you know, responses to, you know, this crisis. You have those in the Novus Ordo and some of the so-called conservative members of the Novus Ordo who would deny that there's any new teaching going on at all. And I think what we've discussed even just a little bit already disproves that. There are clear heresies in Vatican II, clear revolutionary teachings, which directly contradict. And even Benedict XVI himself admits that they directly contradict what the Catholic Church has previously and magisterially taught. So that that position that you know one can just accept this, it's all compatible, it's all conformable, it's all just a matter of interpretation. We'll discuss that more, but it's uh, pretty ridiculous. Uh, you also have the United States uh, so-called bishops um, that they actually in 2001 put up on their official website that campaigns that target Jews for conversion to Christianity are no longer theologically acceptable in the Catholic Church. Think of that. I mean, people have to think about this. Are, the, are you going to say that these guys are Catholics? I mean, this is so ridiculous. This is a total rejection of Jesus Christ. The words of Jesus Christ, the whole gospel's out the window, according to these guys. That's why people, if they stay in communion with these guys, even if they don't like what they're saying, if you say that these guys are Catholics, if you say that these guys are the Catholic Church, you are saying that, uh, that you're in communion with heretics and that they are not heretics and that you respect them as Catholics. You're saying that they still have the Catholic faith because if you regard them as legitimate rulers of the Catholic Church, whether you like it or not, whether you like what they're saying or not, you are saying they have the Catholic faith. That is just a fact. And there are numerous other... Uh bishops, you know, the patriarch of Jeru or excuse me, the bishop that John Paul II chose to be the new bishop in Jerusalem a few years back, he explicitly said that the Catholic Church doesn't want to make Jewish converts. Uh, you have numerous other... Uh, you, you have uh, Roger Mahoney, I mean, the apostate uh, claimant to be the cardinal in Los Angeles, 
who said to a group of rabbis several years ago that the Catholic Church has not one iota of conversionist agenda in regard to the Jews. And it's not like they're dissenting from the teaching of John Paul II or Benedict XVI. Of course, uh, we know that they're just following the teaching of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. And Vatican II, which we already said, teaches that the Jews should not be considered as rejected, which means, therefore, that they're accepted. And also, they accept as being Catholics persons who support abortion, who vote for it, uh, they're able to receive, quote, communion basically at any church, uh, Novus Ordo church, throughout the whole world. This was shown in the case of John Kerry, who's never been excommunicated. In fact, actually, the United States bishops of the Novus Ordo church, they actually uh, created a sort of uh, a policy in the sense that they would allow each bishop to make his own desert decision uh, as how they would deal with pro-abortion candidates that they would let each bishop decide what his individual policy was for his diocese, whether he gave communion to pro-abortion politicians or not. And you had maybe a couple of guys that said maybe they might refuse communion, just about none of them. And in fact, Joseph Ratzinger, who was corresponding with the U.S. bishops at this time uh, uh, during John Paul II's reign, said that the U.S. bishops' policy of making, letting bishops decide what they want, whether they give them communion or not, is very much in line with the Vatican's view on this, this issue. So what that means is that you can be pro-abortion, you can support the killing of the unborn, and you can be a, a, in good standing in the Novus Ordo Church. This is an undeniable fact. No one can deny this. This is apostasy. It's heresy. These guys are total heretics. People need to wake up and realize what's going on. Yeah, actually, yeah, the official policy that was adopted was that they do not excommunicate or exclu officially exclude from communion pro-abortion politicians. And so this claim that the, and see, some of the people, some of these Novus Ordo conservatives we were referring to earlier, they have argued that, well, how could what you're saying be true? In fact, one apologist of the Novus Ordo Church I talked to used this argument. He said, how could what you're saying be true if, you know, these post-conciliar popes have uh, maintained, you know, the fidelity to the teachings on against contraception and and they're against abortion. Well, they aren't really against abortion because, as he just discussed, you can re receive communion and be pro-abortion at the same time in the Vatican II sect. Also, we wanted to discuss also some of the changes in the other sacraments and some of these changes, especially the changes to the Mass, where they essentially change the whole Mass into a Protestant service. It was formulated, Paul VI used the help of six Protestant ministers in creating the Novus Ordo Missae, which he signed on April 3, 1969, the, Novus, the New Order of Mass, which is essentially a Protestant service. They also changed the whole rite of ordination for priests and bishops on June 18, 1968. And what people will find very interesting is that in the Church of England, after King, uh, uh, you know, you had King Edward VI. You had Edward VI who actually implemented a new mass and a new rite of ordination where they removed all the references to a priest receiving the power to offer sacrifice, to bless, to lead, to preach. They removed all the references that a bishop would give to a priest that would make him not just a normal layman, but that he would be receiving powers, you know, that did not belong to a layman, you know. And so, therefore, Paul VI, with the changes that were made in the, the Church of England, where they turned the priests around with the new mass uh, that was implemented there in England, they turned the priests around to face the people, they changed the mass from Latin to English, they gave communion the hand to signify in their minds this just ordinary bread, not the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, all these changes were made uh, by Paul VI when the new Mass was created. And as I was just mentioning, the new rite of ordination that they also established, uh, removing all the references to receiving the powers and offering sacrifice, all these same things were deleted in the new rite of ordination established by Paul VI on June 18, 1968. Prayers like, for example, where the bishop would say, receive the power to offer sacrifice, to bless, to lead, to preach, to offer sacrifice. These things were all removed. And, and this is even admitted by someone like Michael Davies, who is now deceased. 
Uh, he was actually a defender of the new right of ordination. He didn't like it, but he was a defender of its validity. But he was forced to admit in his book on the new right of ordination that, quote, every prayer in the traditional right of ordination, which stated specifically the essential role of a priest as a man ordained to offer propitiatory sacrifice for the living and the dead, has been removed from the new right of Paul VI. In most cases, these were the precise prayers removed by the Protestants. So, and Pope Leo XIII declared that the Anglican rite of ordination was invalid because of those deleted items. And Michael Davies is even admitting that the deleted items from the new rite of ordination are basically the exact same ones that the Protestants removed. Yeah, Leo XIII states that in the whole ordinal, that means the rite of ordination, for the Anglicans, there is no mention of sacrifice, of offering sacrifice. All these things have been removed, deleted, and struck out. And the fruits of this, of course, are you know clear for all to see. That that's why basically anyone who's maintained any traditionalism whatsoever either goes to an independent chapel or is forced to go to an indult mass or has abandoned the the diocesan new mass in one way or another. The, you have polka masses. Uh, carnival masses, balloon masses, clown masses. Uh, it's just a complete joke. And at the heart of this problem are the words of consecration. And in fact, actually, when you look at that issue, the words of consecration, in Matthew 26, verse 28, you see our Lord, when he instituted the sacrament of the Eucharist, he uses the word many. He doesn't use the word all, which is used in all these Novus Ordo masses. In fact, the Catholic Church has stated there is a very specific reason that our Lord said many, and that the specific things that Christ institutes for the sacraments of the Church, the specific words that he uses, that no one could change that. That in a sacrament, such as in the sacrament of the Eucharist, he specifically decreed the word many, as found in Matthew 26, 28. And what it's talking about is the efficacy of his passion. The benefit of it will only avail to those who cooperate with the grace of God and be saved. So this is something that uh, the fruits of Christ's passion only benefit the elect, those who cooperate with the grace of God. It's sufficient to save all, but it is not effective for the salvation of all men. And that's why Christ says, for many... And that's why in the traditional words it, would say, it says, for, for many unto the remission of sins, effective for the remission of the uh, sins of many, not all. And if you put all in there as they've done in the new mass, you're saying that all men are saved, this uh, idea of universal salvation. And also in the Roman altar missile, the missile that the priest uses up on the altar and has used in the traditional uh, Roman Rite of Mass, what we call Latin Trintine Mass now today, for hundreds upon hundreds of years, there's a section in the front called De Defectibus, concerning defects which might arise in the celebration of Mass. And in that, it states what specific words have to be said, the essential words that have to be said for a sacrament to be confected for the bread and wine to change into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. In fact, actually, the word transubstantiation means that the substance of bread and wine is changed into the substance of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. But in order for that to happen, you have to have a valid priest saying these specific words, okay? And it says, this is uh, going back in the Roman altar missal, Pope St. Pius V, he says, these are the words of consecration, okay, or words to this effect. For this is my body, for this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins. And then it says right after that, if anyone removes or changes any of these words in the consecration of the body and blood of the Lord, and by these change of words does not signify the same thing as these words do, he does not confect the sacrament. And in fact, also in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which also can be procured from tan books and publishers on page 227 there's a gigantic paragraph on that page clearly stating and explaining why christ used many and why he did not use all and so therefore we know that the predictions uh we have the prophecies about how the mass at the end of the world will be taken away that the sacrifice shall cease and that has happened uh that we have the sacrifice that has been taken away 
because every single vernacularized translation of the Novus Ordo Omisse has changed the word many to all. Now also, they removed the words mysterium fide out of the consecration. And in that same decree that's in the Roman altar missal, not only does it that state the words that have to be uh, said by the priest for to confect the sacrament of the Eucharist, but it also says, it says if anyone removes any of these words or if anyone changes or anyone removes or changes any of these words. So they change many to all and they remove mystery of faith, place it out of the consecration. And therefore, both of these uh, involve and cause a grave doubt in all Novus Ordo Masses throughout the whole world. Yeah, so to summarize, the church at the Council of Florence declared what the words are. Okay, the new mass has changed those words in a way that the Catechism of Trent says cannot be done, and in a way we know cannot be done validly because Pope Leo XIII teaches in the same bull, Apostolici Curie, where he declared Anglican orders invalid, he said, all know that a sacrament, in order for it to be valid, must signify the grace which it affects and affect the grace which it signifies. The form of a sacrament must do that. Well, what is the grace affected by the sacrament of the Eucharist? That's defined by the Council of Florence. The Council of Florence says that it's the union of the faithful with Christ. That's the grace affected by the sacrament of the Eucharist. That is signified in the form of consecration of the words, for you and for many, unto the remission of sins. The many signifies the faithful, the remission of sins signifies the justification and the union with Christ. When you substitute all there, all are not part of the faithful. All do not have justification and the union with Christ. That is therefore invalid form. And it cannot suffice, according to the teaching of Pope Leo XIII, for a sacrament. And every form of the church, Eastern Rite, signifies the union of the faithful with Christ. And that's why we have idolatry in the Novus Ordo churches, uh, that's what you're dealing with. And that's one of the reasons you see such massive scandals among the priests, such a general apostasy, a lack of faith, almost no one goes to confession anymore, so on and so forth. Uh, now, one thing we were going to discuss as well is there are many who, like we said, recognize that there are heresies in Vatican II, that what's being promoted since Vatican II constitutes a new religion, and they've fled to one of the independent chapels or groups such as the Society of St. Pius X. But what they argue is that none of these teachings in Vatican II is, you know, are binding. And because it was only a pastoral council, they say. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that if the post-Vatican II claimants are to be considered legitimate popes, there's no way around the fact that you would have to accept Vatican II. Paul VI solemnly ratified every document of Vatican II. Every document of Vatican II starts with the words, Paul, bishop, servant of the servants of God, together with the fathers of the sacred council for an everlasting record. That language corresponds to popes at past dogmatic councils, such as Pope Pius IX at Vatican I, Pope Eugene IV at the Council of Florence. It, sig it signifies that the pope is speaking as pastor and teacher of all Christians. That's one of the requirements of papal infallibility. In order for a pope to speak infallibly, he must fulfill three requirements. Number one, he must speak as pastor and teacher of all Christians. He must speak on a point of faith or morals in virtue of his apostolic authority. And he must bind it in a way to be believed by the universal church. Okay, well, what, what we can prove is that if Paul VI was a legitimate pope, he wasn't. We can prove he wasn't an anti -pope. But for those who say he was, such as the... Uh, members of the Society of St. Pius X and similar groups, that he, he, the way he began each document, okay, fulfills the first requirement, that he was speaking as pastor and teacher of all Christians. The second requirement, point of faith or morals, okay, to be believed by the universal church, well, Vatican II is filled with points in, of faith and morals. Every document of Vatican II ends with the words, each and every one of the things set forth in this decree has won the consent of the fathers. We, too, by the apostolic authority conferred on us by Christ, join with the Venerable Fathers in approving, decreeing, and establishing these things. And we order that, that what has thus been established in council be published to God's glory. I, Paul, Bishop of the Catholic Church. So at the end of every document of Vatican II, you have Paul VI's signature, 
He's invoking his apostolic authority, decreeing, establishing, and approving everything in the documents, clearly fulfilling the three requirements which need to be met for a pope to speak infallibly. And what this proves is that Paul VI absolutely could not have had the authority of the papacy because a true pope could never solemnly promulgate the heretical teachings of Vatican II. And it refutes the position of those who would say that, well, I can reject the teachings of Vatican II, but I still accept Paul VI as a true pope. That position is not compatible at all with the facts. And also you have the fact that some people have brought up, well, didn't Paul VI and John the Twenty Third call Vatican II a pastoral council? And actually, uh, in the opening speech that John the Twenty Third gave at the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, he doesn't call Vatican II a pastoral council. He talks about a magisterium, which is predominantly pastoral in character. Okay, so this has caused a lot of confusion among people. And there is a statement from Paul VI uh, on January 12, 1966, I believe it is, where he says that Vatican II is a pastoral council. But this makes no difference because maybe you want to explain, Brother Peter, why, where infallibility t takes place. Well, yeah, the, the, the council was closed on December 8, 1965. And actually, in his closing speech, Paul VI again declared that everything in Vatican II is to be religiously observed. Those are his words, religiously observed, and he uses his, quote, apostolic authority. So after that point, Vatican II has been closed and promulgated. Nothing after that point could undo the authority of Vatican II. So what you have is, are members of the Society of St. Pius X and other groups who point to a speech in 1966, okay, after Vatican II had already been closed, in which Paul VI said that Vatican II had avoided proclaiming in an extraordinary way dogmas affected by the mark of infallibility. As we said, this speech is irrelevant because Vatican II had already been solemnly closed. Furthermore, in the same speech, Paul VI says that Vatican II constitutes the supreme ordinary magisterium. So even if you want to go by this speech, you would have to admit that Vatican II constitutes the supreme ordinary magisterium. And of course, the supreme ordinary magisterium of the church is infallible. So there's no way around it. Anyone who would be quoting that speech would have to admit that Vatican II is binding if they accept Paul VI. One of the things that's also interesting is that those who have read the Third Secret talk about how there will be a massive apostasy seemingly from the top of the Catholic Church, Okay, that the real Sister Lucia, we're going to get into showing how this so-called Sister Lucia just died about a year or two ago, is actually a fraud, that, that the real Sister Lucia was actually killed, uh, we don't know exactly when, sometime around 1960 or prior to that, but in her writings, 1957, 1958, and prior, we know that Sister Lucia stated that the third secret is to be revealed in 1960 or at her death, whatever would take place first. And someone asked her, why 1960? And she said, because it will become clearer then. This also proves why this so-called third secret that the Vatican released is a complete fraud, saying that the Third Secret talks about the forces of evil attacking John Paul II and the shooting of John Paul II on May 13, 1981. That how does this become clear in 1960? It doesn't. And the only event in the Catholic Church of significance that happened um, right before around 1960 was on January 25, 1959. John the 23rd announced that he would be calling this big council that would be changing everything. And what's interesting is that same month and day, January 25th, was the day in 1938 that great lights were seen throughout Europe, which actually Sister Lucia indicated announced the coming of World War II. At Fatima, Our Lady gave three parts to a secret. You know, the first was a vision of hell. The second was the, sec the Second World War that would happen during the reign of Pius XI. And the third secret, which some people have read. And so... The second part of the secret, the warning for it, the notice that you're about to get this, the Second World War happened on January 25th, 1938, with these great lights seen throughout Europe. And Sister Lucia says that is the sign that you're going to get the second part of the punishment. And just so happens that January 25th, same month and day, 1959, John the 23rd announces, we're going to be calling this big council, it's going to be changing everything. 
And that's why some people have indicated that it specifically talks about the Second Vatican Council because out of the, 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 the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, coming out of the Second Vatican Council, you'll have all these changes and the, the devil attempting to de demolish the Catholic faith. Yeah, switching back to Vatican II and what he was saying about Pope Paul IV having declared that the election of a heretic, even if it takes place with the unanimous consent of the cardinals, shall not be considered valid in any way. And so Paul VI, who believed Buddhism is a, one of the riches of Asia, uh, was fully in favor of the post-Vatican II apostasy. He obviously was a manifest heretic and could not have been a legitimate occupant of the See of St. Peter. And that's why God allowed him to solemnly promulgate this robber council, this heretical false council of Vatican II, which teaches clear heresies. And so the only position consistent with Catholic teaching is one which, of course, completely rejects Vatican II and the men who have promulgated and imposed it, the post-conciliar, quote, popes who are actually anti-popes. And one of the cases in church history that's interesting for people to be familiar with is the case of Nestorius, who was the patriarch of Constantinople in the 5th century, just before the Council of Ephesus. And he was the second most prestigious bishop in the Catholic Church at the time, behind the Pope. And on Christmas Day, he stood up in his pulpit and denied that Mary is the mother of God. And none of the clerics opposed him except for one layman in the audience who stood up and denounced his teaching as heretical. And because this layman stood up and denounced his superior of teaching her denounced him for teaching heresy, this caused the faithful to react and discover that Nestorius was a heretic, and they actually anathematized him, recognizing that he actually, in, in fact, had anathematized himself by manifestly departing from the Catholic faith. And they started chanting that we don't have a bishop. They rejected his authority, acknowledging that he had already lost his authority by virtue of having lost the Catholic faith. And popes and councils throughout history praised this Catholic resistance as the authentically Catholic reaction. Not to simply resist what he's saying, but also to conclude properly that because he had departed from the faith in a manifest way, that he lost any authority over this. And what's interesting is St. Robert Bellarmine actually quotes in his uh, passage on the Roman pontiff discussing this period, he quotes a a passage from Pope St. Celestine who says that the faithful who had been excommunicated by Nestorius after he started to preach heresy shall not be considered excommunicated. And he said the clerics who were deposed by Nestorius after Nestorius had started to preach heresy should not be considered deposed. And it said that these persons who preached this heresy, the Pope stated, had no power to you know, excommunicate anyone, that, that all their excommunications, that the persons who were excommunicated by these heretics, you know, were not to be considered as being excommunicated because people who would preach these kinds of heresies have no authority to excommunicate anyone. Because it's a dogmatic teaching of the church that a person who becomes a heretic, a schismatic, or an apostate, ipso facto, by that very fact, is excommunicated from the church. And and if he holds an office, he loses his office. Okay, and that's actually the teaching of the 1917 Code of Canon Law. In Canon 188.4, it says that uh, a cleric loses his office through what's called tacit resignation or silent resignation through public heresy. And so this applies, of course, directly to the situation we're dealing with, with all these bishops in the Novus Ordo you know, whether it's the Diocese of Philadelphia or uh, Los Angeles, so on. These men are obviously manifest heretics. They believe in salvation outside the church. They believe we shouldn't even convert non-Catholics. They uh, are fully involved with the condemned apostasy of ecumenism. They teach that non-Catholics can receive Holy Communion. They consider themselves in the same church as schismatics and, non and Protestants. Uh, on and on and on. Yeah, they actually give donations and relics to schismatic churches, as John Paul II, for example, gave a $100,000 donation to one schismatic church. They actually have given schismatic seminaries, you know, books, 
uh, you know, the use of, of uh, different buildings. Uh, we also have the ecumenical directory that was approved of uh, by John Paul II, the 1993 ecumenical directory, in which you, can, you have all kinds of amazing heresies where Protestants can come into Novus Ordo churches, they can give blessings, they can read stuff, uh, you can jointly own churches with Protestants, that if the Blessed Sacrament offends non-Catholics, that can be moved to the side. I mean, this is truly a church of heretics. So any church father, any doctor of the church, any saint who would see these things, if he were alive today, would of course conclude that these men are manifest heretics who have excommunicated themselves from the church. It's, it's not a question, it, it's a fact. And I think we should go through some of the uh, heresies of Benedict XVI. And also, one other point is that, like, Cardinal Walter Casper, who's one of the highest-ranking members of the Vatican II Church, uh, he said that before Vatican II, we understood ecumenism in the sense of a return in which the others would become Catholics and be converted. This has been entirely rejected since Vatican II. Okay, and we quoted earlier Tally Manimus, January 6, 1928, where he says, For the union of Christians can only be promoted by promoting the return to the one true church of Christ of those who are separated from it. So we see a total opposite teaching here, uh, that we have you know, this guy saying that, no, you don't have to convert at all. I mean, this is a fact. People and, and need to find out, they need to look at the facts regarding these issues, because what they are saying is your is the Catholic faith is utterly and totally meaningless. And some people have said, oh, okay, well, I, I don't have to be Catholic to be saved. Um, it's not necessary. And that's why you have this crisis. That's why there are no vocations uh, and all the rest, the massive apostasy, the, the pedophilia, pederast. You have all of this because one of the main reasons is because people don't believe the Catholic faith is necessary for salvation. And what's interesting is many of the, quote, traditionalists who accept John Paul II, Paul VI, Benedict XVI as true popes, even though they don't like the new orientation, they quote this passage from Casper with horror. Uh, and they, they even say it's heretical, uh, this passage where he says, we no longer understand ecumenism in the sense of a return by which the others would be converted. This was expressly abandoned by Vatican II. Well, these people actually admit that Casper is a heretic based on this passage. Well, what they don't seem to realize is that Benedict XVI has repeated the exact same teaching numerous times uh, in different words. But actually on World Youth Day in 2005, he said almost word for word the same thing in a speech to Protestants. Here's what he said. What does it mean to restore the unity of all Christians? Speaking to Protestants, this unity does not mean what could be called ecumenism of the return. That is to deny and to reject one's own faith history. Absolutely not. So he's clearly repeating the manifest heresy of Casper that we do not want the others converted, and it was expressly abandoned by Vatican II. Benedict XVI has said the exact same thing. He's a manifest heretic. And in fact, in his book, Principles of Catholic Theology, I mean, there's so many heresies from Benedict XVI uh, that we can only give a few, but he actually addresses the question. It's really interesting. He addresses the question of whether non-Catholics are bound to accept Vatican I. He even makes reference to the dogmatic definition uh, of papal primacy and infallibility in 1870. And he says their acceptance of papal primacy and papal infallibility, as defined in Vatican I, is not the way for unity. Totally heretical. He's, he would be automatically anathematized by that fact alone. And see, also, I think also we need to discuss that, you know, people would say, well, some people would say, well, I don't agree with, you know, that statement, or I think that there are problems. And so there's actually a newsletter that uh, we have where it's an example of a, a, a person, say it's a person that believes Bank 16th or John Paul II is a Catholic, trying to convert a non-Catholic to the Catholic faith. And... Yeah, some people say, well, what does that have to do with me? I, I don't agree with it. I live my traditional Catholic life. You know, I'm referring mainly now, we're referring to the people who would hold a traditionalist type position, but not a state of a contest position, one which rejects these guys as antipopes. But the fact of the matter is that if you regard Benedict XVI or John Paul II so and so forth as Catholic, you cannot even 
try to convert a non-Catholic with consistency. Because if you, for instance, tried to convert a non-Catholic, and the non-Catholic said to you that he does not, he will, he's willing to convert, okay, this non-Catholic, but he's not going to accept the Council of Trent. That's what he says to you. And you say, well, you cannot convert to the Catholic faith unless you accept the Council of Trent. It's a dogmatic council. And the non-Catholic could respond, well, John Paul II and Benedict XVI accept justification by faith alone. And they've agreed that the dogmatic canons of Trent do not apply anymore to non-Catholics, and they're not binding. If you regard Benedict XVI and John Paul II as Catholic, you would have to admit that this individual who would adopt the same position could also be a Catholic while rejecting the Council of Trent. And that's another matter we didn't even get into, is the joint declaration with the Lutherans on justification. I mean, this is just a complete joke. The Catholic Church anathematized Martin Luther's heresies of justification by faith alone uh, approximately 13 times. And in 1999, in an agreement with the Lutheran Church, the Vatican agreed that you were justified by faith alone, and it said that none of the condemnations of faith alone and the other Lutheran heresies are binding anymore. Yeah, it lists the, the Lutheran views on justification by faith alone, and it says none of the Lutheran views presented in this document are condemned by the Council in the 16th century, uh, talking about the Council of Trent, and is not being seen as being condemned by Catholic teaching. So basically, they, the post-Vatican II so-called Catholic Church, says that you can hold faith alone, which is condemned in James 2, verse 24, where St. James says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone, which was condemned, as he was saying, 13 times at the Council of Trent solemnly. Now, the uh, approved of by John Paul II on October 31st, 1999, signed by Cardinal Cassidy, they're saying that you can be a Lutheran, hold faith alone, you're not condemned by the Council of Trent, you're not a, a seen being condemned in Catholic teaching, and you can hold that position, and you're fine. And what's amazing is that you have many people who are familiar with this agreement and still deny that any of this constitutes heresy on the part of the post-Vatican II, quote, popes and the bishops. It's It couldn't get any more heretical. Now, some would say... Well, John Paul II and Benedict XVI never signed the joint declaration with the Lutherans on justification. It doesn't make any difference. They're on record as having publicly approved of it numerous times. We have numerous speeches where they've publicly stated that they agree with it. And so, for instance, uh, John Doe could draw up a document denying the Immaculate Conception. And if John Smith gives public speeches praising John Doe's document, he's a manifest heretic. The fact that he didn't sign the document doesn't make any difference. And you have John Paul II and Benedict XVI have praised Martin, uh, Martin Luther. Okay, These guys, the guys that have attempted to destroy the Catholic Church throughout history, praises are heaped upon them constantly. I mean, Zwingli, Huss, Luther, Calvin, all these guys that started their own man-made churches, Okay, which are not a means of salvation but a means of damnation for people, Okay, these guys praise, and the reason why they praise them is because they are totally wicked and evil, and they are of Satan, and that's what people need to realize, because they are heretics. That is what people need to realize. So, and you also have, I mean, just, I mean, we could go through, I don't know how much apostasy here. Also, if people want to, you know, uh, call in we will you know be giving that uh, phone number out if the phone number if you do want to call in would be 585-567-4705 i don't know if we'll be taking any calls today uh because we do want to you know talk about some of this other stuff here but in future shows we definitely will be but yes uh, we'll be covering that but also we have for example we didn't even mention the scc prayer meetings of john paul ii where john paul ii invited all these different false religious leaders to Assisi to pray, as he called it, for peace, peace without God. And the first one was on October 27, 1986. Uh, numerous uh, leaders of false religions came. Okay, he gave them a forum to say their prayers to their false gods and so forth. And, in fact, actually the Dalai Lama who was there actually conducted 
a uh, Buddhist uh, ritual in which he put a statue of Buddha on top of the tabernacle in the Church of St. Francis. I mean, this is utter apostasy. In fact, actually, there is one priest, a Franciscan priest, that actually tried to protest against what was going on. He was carried away by the police at the time. And then you had the second Assisi prayer meeting on January 24, 2002, which may have been even worse, in which actually, again, the leaders of false religions uh, came, including the head high priest of the voodoo worshippers of Benin, Africa. And they, all these different false religious leaders stood in, right in front of John Paul II, and for many minutes, 30, 45 minutes or so, just been told, talked about their religion, promoted their religion, including the voodoo worship, promoting voodooism, which is Satanism. It was listed as traditional African religions, voodooism. The uh, Hindu lady got up. She stood up and said, I greet all of you here who are God. We are all God. I mean, then standing right in front of the anti-pope, John Paul II. And this is utter and total apostasy. And John Paul II has, has covered it with pretty much every religion. He's been to the Lutheran temple. He's been to the Anglican church. He's been to the Buddhist temple. He's been to the great Omiyad Mosque. Oh, in both. fact, actually speaking about the Buddhist temple, when he was in there, I mean, he, he took off his shoes when he entered into the Buddhist temple because he thinks it's holy ground. You know, and in fact, John Paul II also in April of 1986, when he went to visit Gandhi's tomb, again took off his shoes, you know, because he felt he was on holy ground. Gandhi, you know, is just a human being, and uh, he wasn't a, ca a Catholic, and he feels everyone's going to heaven. So he has, he venerated Gandhi, prayed at his tomb, took his shoes off, um, you know, and, and in fact, actually, we find that God commands Moses to take off his shoes, his sandals, because he says to him, you're standing on holy ground. And so this is just basically the devil laughing at uh, Catholics and, and, and attempting to mock the traditional Catholic religion by taking his shoes off, uh, going into these pagan temples and these false religions, in, including the Buddhist temple, going in there in which he bowed to the, the quote, supreme Buddhist patriarch, uh, and who, who sat in front of a gigantic statue of Buddha. I mean, you're talking about, throughout the whole history of the Catholic Church, people shedding their blood and going through the most cruel martyrdoms not to engage in one bit of this kind of activity. All of this mocked by John Paul II and these other apostates, Benedict XVI, saying that it was all meaningless, they all died in vain, and this brings us to what's predicted in the apocalypse, namely the whore of Babylon, which is a counterfeit Catholic church that is set up from Rome. And we see in 1 Peter, St. Peter talking about Rome as, he describes it as Babylon. Okay, it's, it's, it's given as a code name for the city of Rome. And so it says in the apocalypse, Babylon, Babylon, Rome, Rome has fallen. Okay, it's, it has fallen from the faith. That great city, it was once great because throughout its history, for the most part, it was associated with Catholicism. But at the end of the world, the city falls from the, from the faith. Not the Catholic faith loses the faith, but Rome loses the faith. And as the supreme punishment for the sins of the world, God allows it, his, the infrastructure, the buildings, to be infiltrated, occupied, and seemingly controlled, just like... He, owned, he allowed his own body to be handled by his enemies and crucified that he will allow at the end of the world as the church goes through its passion for the church to be, you know, you know, uh, scorned and, and mocked and, and so forth. And so we have a lot of these statements like it talks about the whore of Babylon being drunk with the blood of the saints. And, and it's precisely because it's mocking all of the saints and martyrs who died uh, for the faith, not to compromise the faith one bit. In fact, it talks about the saints under the altar. Okay, so it's specifically talking about what's happening in the Catholic world. That's what non-Catholics need to realize here, that the saints cry out from under the altar, how long, O Lord, will you await to avenge us? Why would they be saying that? They're saying that because there's this abomination, namely, it's called the Novus Ordo Mass, being celebrated on these altars, and we have the relics, uh, you know, you have to have relics of, of uh, martyrs, you know, in the altar itself. And so it's specifically describing Catholic martyrs. Something abominable is going on in the last days, and they're crying out for the Lord to, 
take vengeance upon this activity and these people that are doing these very things. And it talks about Apocalypse 18, verses 4 and 5 of come out of her, come out of the false church. And it talks about how the church, this false church, is a whore. And describing whoredom and, and being a whore in the Old Testament was mingling with false religions, compromising the faith. And so, therefore, this post-Vatican II church mingles with every religion, respects every religion, gives in to every kind of act of apostasy. And it's contrasted with the church, which is the bride of Christ. This false church is a whore. It says, I, the whore says in the apocalypse, I sit a queen and am no widow. And so, basically, this false church is out on its own. It's, uh, you know, abandon its bride. Jesus Christ, it talks about how the voice of the bride and of the bridegroom shall no longer be heard in the whore of Babylon. That's talking about the words of Jesus Christ and the words and teachings of his church will no longer be heard in this false church, the whore of Babylon. In fact, it actually also talks about four times in the apocalypse. It talks about um, the whole world is made mad by the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And what's interesting is we are earlier talking about how they changed the words of consecration, many to all, and removing the words mystery of faith. Both those changes are in the wine portion of the words of consecration, okay? The wine portion of the consecration, both those changes which invalidates the consecration because the priest who's going to offer the sacrifice has to recite the whole form. He has to have the intention of the church, okay? So they've changed the consecration, their masses are invalid, and therefore the whole world is made mad by the fact that you no longer have the valid Eucharist in almost 100% of so-called Catholic churches throughout the world. And uh, all these other things talking about uh, the, this false church that we see since the Second Vatican Council. And because it's a fulfillment of apocalyptic prophecy, and as he was saying, these men are extremely evil, that's why we see signs of this, like Paul VI. We have many pictures of this in our videos and on our website. He's seen wearing the breastplate of a Jewish high priest. He gave away the papal tiara to a Jewish merchant. Okay, this is symbolic that he's an infiltrator and he's giving away the house. He's trying to, uh, but since he's an antipope, thankfully he, he can't. He can, he can only try to persecute the church uh, by creating this counter-church. Uh, we see them carrying the broken cross, which uh, is a distorted crucifix, which is, was used historically by Satanists and uh, practitioners of witchcraft. Um, another point that's interesting is we were talking about Nestorius, uh, the 5th century patriarch of Constantinople who became a heretic and was denounced by a layman, and the Catholics concluded that he had lost his office and that this reaction was praised by popes. Well, this applies to our situation in more ways than one because John Paul II, among his many heresies, and uh, there's so many we've just ba basically scratched the surface here, he teaches a form of Nestorianism. And what Nestorius held was uh, a perversion of the incarnation. The Catholic Church teaches that the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, assumed a human nature and became man. So that our Lord Jesus Christ is one divine person with two natures. But what Nestorius held, and this was his heresy, was that the Son of God did not become man, but that he united himself in a certain way with a man. So that our Lord Jesus Christ was not a divine person with two natures, but he was a person carrying a divine person. It's, it's even perverse to... Uh, it's so perverted, it's difficult to even imagine. But this is what Nestorius held, that the Son of God united himself in a certain way with Jesus. Okay, and therefore that there were two persons in Jesus. And what's fascinating about this is that this heresy was anathematized by the Council of Ephesus in 431, and it was condemned again by the Second Council of Constantinople in the 6th century. And in condemning it the second time, at the Second Council of Constantinople, it said that Nestorius' Nestorius's heresy brought in the worship of two sons. Okay, he divided Christ, the Second Council of Constantinople says, bringing in the worship of two sons and the worship of man. 
Those are the words of the Second Council of Constantinople analyzing the heresy of Nestorius. Well, John Paul II taught hundreds of times that in the Incarnation, the Son of God united himself in a certain way with every man. Same principle as Nestorius, except that it was applied to everyone. And just as the Second Council of Constantinople said that the result of Nestorius's heresy was that it divided Christ, bringing in the worship of two sons and therefore the worship of a man, John Paul II's heresy results in the worship of every man. And that's why in his very first encyclical, Redemptor Hominus No. 10, immediately after explaining his heretical view that in the Incarnation the Son of God united himself with everyone, he says that Christianity is the deep amazement at man, proving that in his doctrine, the worship of man results from his view of the Incarnation, exactly as Nestorius taught. And that's why we have, throughout his whole anti-pontificate, hundreds of quotes where he's equating man with God uh, in sometimes bold ways, sometimes subtle ways, but he's fully aware of what he's doing. In fact, in his very first speech, and we have a copy of this, it's really so incredible that it's, it's almost hard for some people to believe that, that he could be this evil. But John Paul II, in his very first homily, he actually gave a homily on the words of Matthew 16.16, 16, where St. Peter professed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the subject of John Paul II's first homily in 1978. And John Paul II repeats these words numerous times in the homily. He says, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he says, in these words is contained the new truth, the ultimate and definitive truth about man. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He directly applies the words of Matthew 16, 16 to man. This is St. Peter's confession yeah. about how Christ... Yeah, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In those words is the faith of the church. In those same words is the new truth. Indeed, the ultimate and definitive truth about man, the Son of the living God, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is what he was involved with. And also you have him on December 25th, 1978, in his first Christmas address to the world. He says, I'm addressing this message to everyone. Christmas is the feast of man. Same thing. It's, it's, and this is why Pope Pius X pointed out in his first encyclical, E Supreme Apostolatus, October 4th, 1903, he said, The distinguishing mark of the Antichrist, man has with infinite temerity put himself in the place of God. The substitution of man for God. That's why his first encyclical says the gospel is the amazement at man. And that's why it's all about man. It's all about man's dignity, man's rights. It's all, And that's why whenever you hear post-Vatican II people talking about why are these things so important? What's going on? And why do we have to fight for theological issues even? You know, it's all about respecting the dignity of man, the truth about man, his dignity, his greatness. It's, 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 it's now Christ has been substituted. Man has been put in the place of God. And you don't, I mean, even just analyzing the religion that is practiced in the diocese, one can come to the conclusion that something uh, massively wrong has happened here. And people can conclude that this is not the Catholic faith, and, and that's why so many who have heard this information have said, yes, I knew something was wrong, but I just I couldn't put my finger on it. And, and it's really obvious to those who want to accept the truth and accept the facts. And I don't know if you mentioned about Pius XI's statement about Nestorius. But, uh, oh, yeah, Pope Pius XI, uh, in his encyclical Lux Veritas, he says that, uh, that Nestorius' heresy by which he said that there were two persons in Christ, was the dissolving of Christ. Now, in the, the epistles of St. John, St. John defines the doctrine of Antichrist as he who dissolveth Christ. That's the biblical definition for the doctrine of Antichrist, he who dissolveth Christ. And Pope Pius XI says that Nestorius' teaching was that very biblical fulfillment. He dissolved Christ by dividing Christ into two, which brought in the worship of man. Therefore, since John Paul II's heresy 
that the Son of God united himself in the incarnation with every man, which makes the gospel the amazement at every man, is the precise fulfillment of the biblical teaching on what the dissolving of Christ is. He is personifying the doctrine of Antichrist, as Scripture teaches. And so, and also you have John Paul II, as we prove in issue five of our magazine, which you can get if you uh, order that package of materials for $8, a whole issue where there are just numerous statements listed where he's preaching that man is God over and over again. Uh, you know, and that's that's why he said that man is the way, man is the truth, man is the life. And of course, we have our Lord saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That man is the Lord and Savior. You know, uh, each man was nailed to the cross. The face of Christ is the face of each man. The epiphany is the manifestation of man. Advent is the coming of man. The day of the Lord is the day of man. Uh, to study man is to study God. Man is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Man is begotten of God the Father. And we actually hope to have the, a video uh, in which we did about this very subject of how he preached that man was God up on our website uh, quite soon. You know, And so we have this stuff, this activity he was mentioning about um, you know, about uh, the, uh, the ephod that Paul VI wore. We also have John Paul II on March 24, 2000, sitting in front of about 100,000 people in Israel with a gigantic upside-down cross over his head, as you can see on our website. We also have a picture of John Paul II wearing a chasuble in which there's an upside-down cross you know, on his vestment. Uh, you know, This is something where you have these signs to indicate what you're dealing with. You're dealing with Antichrist. And so um, you're dealing with the fulfillment of Our Lady's words, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. And a series of Antichrist anti-popes. And, and also you have these false apparitions that our Lord talks about. If they shall say that I am in the desert, in the closet, do not go, do not believe it. And he talks about there will be false signs and wonders to deceive if it were possible, even the elect, Matthew 24, 24. And so therefore, if those things about... Be careful, don't follow, you know, if someone's saying I'm appearing here or there, you've had this proliferation of different apparitions of people who have claimed to see Jesus and Mary uh, saying, and in many of these apparitions such as Bayside, Medjugorje, Medjugorje, for example, the message says in God's eyes all religions are the same. You are divided on the earth. My son sees all religions as the same. Uh, all these kinds of heresies promoted, accompanied by false signs and wonders, um, and then you have you have you have a whole uh, spectrum of different false apparitions. Some cons a little bit more conservative than others. Some a little bit more liberal. You know, on and on and on. So you see this stuff that these are the signs and wonders that are spoken about in the Bible, uh, where they're attempting. The devil is going to attempt to deceive people and get people off the right track and get people away from the teachings, the traditional defined teachings of the Catholic Church by people thinking that Jesus and Mary are speaking. So, oh, this is Jesus and Mary? Then we're just going to follow what they're saying, and I'm not going to find out what the Catholic Church teaches, or I'm not going to research this stuff or what's going on or find out what the infallible teachings of the Church are. I'm just going to follow what they think is Jesus and Mary, which actually will not be Jesus and Mary in many cases, but will actually be the devil attempting to appear as Jesus and Mary. And so you have this new gospel preached. St. Paul says in Galatians 1, 8, 9, though we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel other than what has been given to you, let him be anathema. You have the our Lord talking about in Matthew chapter 7, beware of false prophets that come to you in the clothing of sheep. And this is why this is so important. A lot of people say, well, I'm just going to follow my priest. I'm just going to follow this person. I shouldn't have to find out about this stuff. I'm just going to follow some person that claims to be a minister of God. And that's why our Lord says in Matthew chapter 7 that beware. He's saying to beware of wolves that come to you in the clothing of sheep because you'll lose your soul, soul too if you follow him. It's not just the minister that's going to go to hell you'll also go to hell, too, if you follow him. And that's why you can't put your trust in men. The Psalms say, put not your trust in men and princes in whom there's no salvation. You have to put your trust in God. You have to find out what the Catholic Church has always taught and hold fast to that. As St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, to maintain the traditions which you have learned, either by word 
or by epistle. And so that's, that's uh, what's going on. And uh, what's interesting is uh, St. John in his epistles in the Bible also gives as the other definition for Antichrist, in addition to the dissolving of Christ, he gives the definition is he who denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist. And we've discussed how John Paul II personified the dissolving of Jesus. Paul VI personified Antichrist by wearing the uh, breastplate of the Jewish high priest, take, killing Christ in the Mass by taking away the Mass, by substituting man for God in the Mass. That's why the worship is oriented toward man. You have kitty Masses, children's Masses, clown Masses, all to appease man, all to make the Gospel palatable to man. You have enculturation, bringing in different religions and so forth. We also saw John Paul II on numerous occasions uh, and like Papua New Guinea, for example, you know, attending a, quote, mass uh, where the woman who read the epistle was completely, uh, you know, bare-breasted. And, and this, this just didn't happen one time. I mean, he met with people, bare-breasted, smiling at them and, and so forth. And these cultures are in darkness, and they need the true faith and baptism to be, have the darkness and, of the devil removed from their cultures and their life. And he basically... You know, just promoted this. And, and then, of course, with Vatican Council, too, it promotes that we should bring in these different, you know, drum beats. And as he was mentioning, all these different masses, kitty masses, animal masses, dog masses, juggling masses, all these kinds of abominations, which are so far from Catholicism that they actually make Protestant services look far more Catholic. And what's interesting is um, while John Paul II to our knowledge, never denied that Jesus was the Messiah. He taught that everyone is Christ, but he never denied that Jesus was the Messiah, the other definition for Antichrist. What's very interesting is that Benedict XVI actually covers the other definition for Antichrist given in, in the Bible. In his book, for instance, God in the World and Milestones, Benedict XVI says that to read the Bible as the Jews do, who do not see our Lord as the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, is a valid way of reading Scripture. And he says they cannot be accused of ill will for having done that. And therefore, he's denying that Jesus is necessarily the Christ. And that's why in Cologne, Germany, he went into the synagogue, he recited the Kaddish prayer with the rabbi there. When he went into the synagogue, you had all the Jews applauding him, and it's, nothing could be more obvious that he's saying, you are fine. You know, and you had old, really old Jewish people coming up to meet him, you know, shake their hands. And he's mentioning nothing about that they have to uh, believe in Christ and be baptized and join the Catholic Church. The, you know, and so he has no charity for these people at all. He, he doesn't care, obviously, that they're, they're headed for eternal damnation. And uh, this is just utter and total apostasy. Here's a quote. Um, from God in the world. Uh, he says, It is, of course, possible to read the Old Testament so that it is not directed toward Christ. It is not point quite unequivocally to Christ. There are perfectly good reasons for denying that the Old Testament refers to Christ. We're going to take a call from Adam. Hello, Adam. Hello. Hi. Hello, how are you? Okay. Um. Yeah, I have a question regarding the uh, Eastern Rites that are in communion with the Vatican. Okay. Um, I'm actually uh, baptized in, uh, and confirmed myself in the, in the Maronite Rite, and I was just wondering, I have a question regarding the validity of that, of, of both the baptism and the confirmation. Well, you know, anyone, the Church teaches, for instance, at the Council of Florence, that anyone can validly baptize, a layman, even a non-Catholic. Um, you don't have to be a validly ordained priest. So as long as one adheres to the church's form, I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, the baptism would be valid. Okay. Uh, regarding confirmation, uh, the Eastern Rites have not changed the essential elements of their liturgical rites. Mm -hmm. So if the confirmation was done in accordance with the traditional Eastern Rite, it would be valid. Okay. And, and that's what people need to realize, that in the Eastern Rites, if the person, if the priest, for example, was ordained the Eastern or Byzantine Rites, say, of ordination, you know, he would be a validly ordained priest. And they have not changed the word many to all in the uh, liturgy uh, that they use. Uh, but some of the priests may be, you know, so heretical 
uh, and we've encountered you know, some of them talking to them. It depends upon which priest you talk to. There are many different priests out there that have different feelings about what's going on. But there unfortunately are some priests that, for example, think that uh, John Paul II and Benedict XVI going into the synagogue and, and praying with Jews and praising different religions, that that's great. I mean, if a, even a validly ordained priest, say an Eastern Rite priest, doesn't believe that our goal is to try to bring people into the Catholic Church, he would actually be in, in the category of being a notorious heretic. I mean, if he doesn't believe that the goal is to eventually bring people into this church, that that's our goal, to convert people. If he rejects that, which some of them definitely do, some of these Eastern Rite priests are as radical as the most radical Novus Ordo priests. So a person really has to be careful. And also, because they do accept Vatican Council II or tacitly accept the teachings of the Second Vatican Council and these antipopes, if someone were to attend uh, even one of these priests that might be validly ordained in, in an Eastern Rite, someone couldn't financially support uh, throw any money in the collection basket, you know. Uh, and so a person could only use them to go to confession, receive communion, and that's about it. It's, it's, a, it's a very tragic situation. It's unfortunate. We don't enjoy telling people that, you know, you, you just can't contribute. We don't, you know, but the fact of the matter is someone cannot contribute because if someone goes there and says, uh, well, yeah, I don't agree with the priest and I don't agree that he doesn't oppose the her heresies of Vatican II and these anti-popes, and not to say anything about the fact that none of them say anything about head coverings for women, dress codes, uh, you know, violations that are going on. They don't, they don't usually say a anything. Uh, and so, therefore, a person uh, not to partake uh, in the sin, really, of, of what they're doing uh, could not directly support them financially. You're only allowed to go there because we're in a total emergency a total crisis, and um, you're allowed by the teaching of the church in an extraordinary situation to go to priests that are validly ordained, offering a valid rite of liturgy, and receive the sacraments from them. But someone cannot give them any direct financial assistance. And so that's why a lot of people that have heard about our information that have gone back to an Eastern Rite liturgy or a Latin Tridentine Mass, you know, they may say, well, I just feel I have to give something to these priests. If they feel that way, then all these issues that we're talking about are utterly meaningless, which they're not meaningless, but they're taking the view that they are meaningless by contributing to groups and to priests that feel that they are meaningless. Yeah, I was actually going to maybe talk about the Great Western Schism a little bit, um, because some people say that this is impossible, what you're asserting, that it it just is unthinkable that this would ever occur. Well, we've already gone through the teaching of Pope Paul IV, who says that uh, a heretic cannot be a validly elected pope. He even says in that bull that he's issuing this bull to prevent the abomination of desolation from coming to pass in the holy place. So it's very interesting that the magisterium itself is saying that the abomination of desolation is connected possibly with an anti-pope posing as the pope. But what's interesting is the Great Western Schism, many people are familiar with it, but not many people really appreciate how bad it was. Um, in the year 1378, uh, Pope Urban VI was elected. Now, Pope Gregory XI had actually just returned the papacy to Rome. The papacy had spent uh, 70 years in Avignon due to political turmoil. And so Pope Gregory XI brought it back to Rome. And Pope Urban VI was the first pope elected when the papacy had been brought back to Rome. And after his election, um, he, w he dealt very roughly with a lot of the cardinals. And they didn't like his treatment of them. And so what they did was they elected their own pope, Clement VII, on the grounds that Urban VI's election was not valid because uh, the Roman mob had influenced the, the situation because they were clamoring for a Roman pope after having the papacy so long away from Rome. And so now some may say this doesn't seem like a very good argument, but... St. Vincent Ferrer was actually following this line of anti-popes for a time that we're going to be discussing. Pope Clement VII was elected um, as in Avignon, okay, and so he claimed to be the pope at the same time that you had Pope Urban VI in Rome claiming to, be, claiming to be the pope. And Christendom was divided at the time. You had countries divided, 
And you had the two popes excommunicating each other. They actually declared a crusade against each other. And the situation was so bad that Father John Lau in his book Church History says it was the worst crisis in church history. You know, you had two bishops and dioceses. You had massive confusion. Okay, but it, it was just getting started because some of the cardinals, okay, from Pope Urban VI support and anti-Pope Clement VII support, and it wasn't clear he wasn't the anti-Pope too many, uh, got fed up with the two because they actually were negotiating to possibly both abdicate so that they could elect a common pope that everyone would accept. And the fact uh, that they even wanted to negotiate, even though actually Urban VI was a little bit uh, hostile to those negotiations, uh, shows how massive the, the confusion was. But what's interesting is that cardinals from both camps got fed up with Pope Urban VI and anti-Pope Clement VII, and they called a council at Pisa, and they elected Pope Alexander V, who actually was an anti-pope, because we know Pope Urban VI was the originally validly elected pope. But to many, Alexander V was the legitimate pope, because you actually had cardinals from both Urban VI camp and Clement VII's camp, who actually by that time had been succeeded by Benedict the Thirteenth, who uh, Clement the Seventh died, and then you had another Avignon anti-pope, Benedict the Thirteenth. So the cardinals got fed up from those two camps. They at Pisa elected Alexander the Fifth, okay, and then he was succeeded. He he died in about a year, and then he was succeeded by anti-pope John the Twenty-Third, the first one. And ju just a side note, the parallels of this John the Twenty-Third with the John the Twenty-Third that just recently reigned from 1958 to 1963, was it, or two, I, I can't remember. Uh, three. It's 1963. For five years, I mean, the parallels are amazing that this John the Twenty-Third during the Great Western Schism calls a false council. He uh, calls it in the what, fourth, fourth year, year of his reign. reign, which the recent John the Twenty Third called Vatican II in the fourth year of his reign. Uh, all the other parallels which we have on our website are, are astounding. And uh, maybe you wanted to go back. On well, that. yeah, I just want to quickly finish this up. That so you had um, the popes in Rome, and and then you had the anti popes in Avignon. But Christendom was divided, and so the cardinals, many of the cardinals from both camps, were fed up with both of them. And so they elected their own guy at Pisa, Alexander V, who had died and was succeeded by John XXIII. But most of the Catholic world rallied to the Pisan line, okay, because it seemed to have the support of both camps. And it seemed to have been done with more, you know, authority and solemnity. And so basically, it was really bad when you had two claimants. Then you had three claimants, Christendom divided. You had three bishops in many in dioceses. You had three heads of religious orders. Okay, you had all kinds of excommunications flying this way and that. Okay, it was just a total nightmare. And so those who would say that this is unthinkable, that you could have this kind of con confusion and, and this many people deceived and this many people misled, if that were simply a crisis that God allowed in the course of church history, what would he allow in the last days? And that's why theologians have said that, you know, people would say that it's not possible to have something like the Great Western Schism, and it did happen. And he even predicts this uh, Father Edmund O'Reilly, who is a, an eminent theologian of the last century, he says that we may see something even far worse than the Great Western Schism before the wrapping up, before the end of the world. And also, not to mention anything about the Arian crisis, where you had the bishops, 97, according to Father William Jurgens, who wrote the thir three volume set, The Faith of the Early Fathers, he said that 97 to 99% of the Catholic bishops became Arian during the Arian crisis. In fact, St. Jerome said about the Arian crisis, the whole world awoke and found itself to be Arian. Okay, so Arian crisis, 97 to 99% of the bishops become Arian, cease to be Catholics. You have the Great Western Schism. Okay, with all this confusion, people excommunicating each other. People don't know, uh, you know, some people are confused what pope is the true pope. And we're going to have something far worse uh, that's going to happen in the last days. And so that's why people would say, oh, it's impossible. You know, this, this, this can't be happening. Well, it is happening. We can prove it's happening. And people have to realize it's happening.
And there's actually another case that's really interesting to quickly uh, discuss, the case of Anacletus II and Pope Innocent II. Um, around the year 1130, Pope Boniface II was dying, and there was such uh, you know, corruption among Rome at the time that they were afraid that if they had the College of Cardinals elect the Pope in the normal manner, that you couldn't get a fair election. There would be too much deceit going on. And so what happened was the Chancellor of Pope uh, Honorius II arranged that immediately after Pope Honorius II's death, a small commission of the cardinals would elect the Pope. An eight-member panel would elect the Pope. This was irregular because normally you'd have many more cardinals. And so what happened was shortly after uh, Honorius II died, there was this secret meeting, eight-member panel, and all but two of them elected Pope Innocent II. And w by the way, on the eight-member panel was this Peter Pierleone, who actually will, would be the future Anacletus II. So what's interesting is you had this eight-member panel, or part of it, elected Pope Innocent II in 1130. Well, later that same day, a much, more a much larger gathering of the cardinals elected Anacletus, with the whole city of Rome supporting it. And so on the same day, you had Innocent II enthroned and consecrated as the Pope, and you had Anacletus II enthroned and consecrated as the Pope. And the grounds for the Anacletus camp was that uh, Innocent II's party was only with this small panel. It was basically done in secret, they said. So it was in a regular election. But we know that he was actually the legitimate Pope because this eight-member panel was with the approval uh, prior to his death of Pope Honorius II. And so what you had was massive confusion. The majority of the College of Cardinals went with the anti-Pope, Anacletus II, who actually was successful in gaining Rome and stayed in Rome, enthroned in St. Peter's for eight years. He was an anti-Pope. It was only much later on when St. Bernard rallied support to Pope Innocent II that they were actually able to drive anti-Pope Anacletus II out of Rome. But this just shows you, again, this is just one example of many, that anti-Popes have, have uh, you know, reigned and deceived people, and it's not incompatible with the indefectibility of the Church. And also, just going back to, we mentioned earlier about the fake Sister Lucia, uh, she actually has done uh, interviews, the one that just uh, recently died, in which she over and over again stated that the consecration uh, has been done by John Paul II, that the third secret was never intended to be revealed. In fact, I actually happened to meet someone who was involved in interviewing this fake Sister Lucia in 1992. He told me that there are very serious problems with her, her not being able to answer certain basic questions. In fact, in the interview that was done two hours with Sister Lucia, uh, and as I said, I, I met one of the people that was involved with that interview, uh, the question was asked to this fake Sister Lucia, uh, was the third secret intended to be revealed? Did, didn't Our Lady say that the, thir that the third secret is to be revealed and released in 1960 at the latest? And this fake Sister Lucia said, Our Lady never said that. It was intended only for the Pope. Okay? This flies in the face of the, what the true Sister Lucia said, 1958 and prior. Okay? It's a total and utter contradiction. She's saying that, no, the fake one's saying, no, the third secret was never intended to be revealed. The real one is saying it was, it's to be released in 1960 because it will become clear then. And then, as can be seen on the website, um, you can see the photographic evidence of how this so-called Sister Lucia is a fraud. In fact, actually, when she recently appeared in Fatima, she was like 96 or years old or so. And you look at the fluidity of movement, how, how quickly she's walking, the way she looks. People even commented on how young she looked for someone that was about almost 100 years old. Um, you know, all these contradictions. And so the reason why this fake Sister Lucia wasn't able to come out and more publicly talk to a lot of people about this issue is because they're really concerned with people discovering that this is actually a fraud, that they actually have someone playing the part. And someone would say, well, I just don't believe that's possible. Well, it is not only possible, but it has happened. We have the proof because the devil is behind it. The devil wants to tell people, look at Sister Lucia. She goes to the new mass. She believes John Paul II is the pope. 
Therefore, you should believe he's Pope. You should follow these teachings because she was promised heaven. And so therefore, you might as well take the safer course and follow what she's doing. And so that's why a lot of people have just simply, you know, gone to the new mass because they say, well, it looks like Sister Lucia goes to the new mass and follows uh, the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. But they haven't realized probably yet. Now they have the chance to discover that this was actually a fraud. And we have the evidence, the pictures of her teeth and the other things that have come out uh, that, that prove that this fake Sister Lucia is, is a fraud. Uh, one of the other points that we wanted to mention also is another thing that proves that these guys are not true popes. Uh, someone would say, well, aren't what, isn't what you're saying saying that the gates of hell have prevailed against the Catholic Church? Christ promised that that wouldn't happen in Matthew 16. Well, no, because popes have defined what the gates of hell are, and they've defined the gates of hell as being heretics. And so actually when people see this information that proves that these anti-popes are heretics and they assert over and over again and continue to assert that these guys have legitimate authority, that they're real rulers, that they have legitimate authority, they're true popes, they are actually asserting that the gates of hell have prevailed against the church because the gates of hell are actually heretics. And one other point is that many, uh, quote, traditional groups out there reject the canonizations of these anti-popes, uh, such as John Paul II's canonizations. The Society Pius X, for example, states that we don't accept the canonizations that John Paul II has done. And people need to realize that to do that, to reject the canonizations of the man you feel is a true pope or, or uh, would be a true pope, is a schismatic act. That's why St. Thomas Aquinas points out that canonizations are infallible. The formula that these anti-popes are using to, quote, canonize people is essentially the exact same canonization formula that was used prior to Vatican II. And so if you reject these, quote, saints that they're producing now, uh, you, you, why do you accept any person as a saint? Yeah, that, that's one of the most ridiculous uh, positions of those groups who s maintain obstinately that the post-Vatican II anti-popes are true popes but reject you know, most, most of what they do, such as the Society of St. Pius X and similar independent groups. They reject his, quote, canonization of Jose Maria Scriva. They're going to reject his, uh, Benedict XVI's, quote, canonization of Jean Paul II when he finally does it, and Mother Teresa and other heretics. But this is just, it's completely incompatible with Catholic teaching, which teaches that a pope cannot err in canonizing a saint. Yeah, and see, and a lot of people said that when uh, certain people were, quote, canonized, that God won't allow that to happen, such as members of the Society Pius X, for example. They say God will not allow it to happen, and of course it happened, and of course they kept the same position, you know, and they say the same thing about if Benedict XVI, quote, canonizes John Paul II, that will not happen. That is definitely going to happen if this situation continues to go. And these people will basically just come up with some kind of schismatic excuse to not accept it or just say it's not infallible. Rather than coming to the correct conclusion that these post-Vatican II, quote, popes are not popes at all, but anti-popes, which is why their actions are so heretical and have no authority. And w another important point quickly to mention is that heresy is manifested not only by word, but also by deed. Most of the heretics in, in the world are known to be heretics by their deeds, such as, you know, they frequent non-Catholic churches and they haven't issued any, you know, written statements declaring that they're heretics. They're considered to be heretics by their deeds. And that's why St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica says that if anyone were to worship at the tomb of Muhammad, that action would, would constitute apostasy because it would constitute an acceptance of the Islamic faith. Well, John Paul II did the equivalent of that by kissing the Koran, going to the mosque, and all these other actions where he's giving the uh, pectoral cross to, you know, the phony bishop of Anglican bishop of Canterbury and and so on, action after action. All of this manifests heresy by deed as well as by his heretical words. Even the way that many of these groups operate outside the ordinaries I mean, you have statements from early church fathers that talk about how someone who would not operate within the jurisdiction of the local bishop doesn't have a clean conscience. 
I mean, it's something where this is actually schismatic. I mean, and, and in the case of the Society Pius X, they have to, to come to the realization of how schismatic their position is. I mean, we're not talking about like a very short period of time, and we're talking about rejecting canonizations. We've shown how the documents of Vatican II have been absolutely solemnly defined. They're as infallible, uh, if they're going to say he's a pope, as any of the ratifications of any of the true councils throughout the history of the church. The fact that these guys are heretics, they don't call them heretics. They say they have heirs. No, yeah. these aren't heirs. These are heresies. These guys are heretics, okay? And so, therefore, and also they, they uh, you know, operate completely independently. For example, the Code of Canon Law points out that in order to be a pastor of the church, which a lot of these Society Pius X churches, they say that I'm the pastor of this church. No, that's not the way it works. A bishop appoints a pastor of the church. You know, a bishop has to be told when a priest is coming within his jurisdiction of his area, for example, so that he has jurisdiction to hear confessions. I mean, all these other things, uh, marriages, all this other... So they're completely independent of these guys. They're not regarded as being in the same church by the authorities of the post-Vatican II church. That's why you can ask anyone, are they in communion? And they'll say no. In fact, the Society of St. Pius X leaders, such as Schmidberger and others, have declared that they're not in communion with the counterfeit Vatican II church. Yeah, they call it a new religion. The religion of the Vatican II is a new religion. It is a new church. Uh, sorry, who's the head of this new church? Yeah, anymore? they're refusing communion with the entire false church while maintaining communion with the very head of the false church. It's, it's a, totally illogical, and it's contrary to the teaching of the Catholic Church, and they need to come to the realization that this is a false church from top to bottom, which has no authority. And so I think that uh, for today uh, will be it. Please stay tuned. Uh, look at our website. Uh, this Friday or Saturday we will have another radio program, and we hope everyone gained uh, some benefit uh, from this program and realizes you know what's really going on with this apostasy thank you